Hi everyone, um, thank you for coming to today's uh, Department of Epidemiology and Public Health Seminar. So today we're delighted to um, welcome Sean Curran, who's um, here for Eileen's graduation. Um, and he's kindly taken some time out of his schedule to come to us and talk about um, his work with Boston Scientific. So the title of today's presentation is an overview of Boston Scientific Therapies and the use of statistical methods to validate them. So hopefully we'll have time for comments and questions at the end, but right now over to Sean. Great, thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm kind of surprised I thought Friday afternoon in court. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I do work at Boston Scientific. Anybody here know about Boston? What do you know about Boston Scientific? Ever heard of it? Yeah, it's a company. Any idea what you do? <laughs> no. No? Calculators. Calculators. <laughs> <laughs> Texas Instruments. I remember when I got my first one. Like, you know, regressions of straight lines. Wow. Re so, reverse Polish notation. Hmm? And reverse Polish notation. Reverse Polish notation. Exactly right. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, is Boston Scientific. Uh, near and dear to my heart. Number one, because it didn't pay my salary. So that's a good thing. Uh, but number two, I'm going to talk about one of the devices I'm going to talk about today is very personal. Um, my wife's mother just got one of our devices put in. And it was a replacement valve for her aorta three weeks ago. And the woman went from not being able to get out of bed in the morning to walk in a half a mile. So that's why I like working for Boston Scientific. It's the stuff we do. OK, so first, the legalese. So if I say something wrong, you can't sue me. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer said, I have to give you that. So there you go. OK, so that is our mission. Okay. Transform lives, innovative medical solutions. We are what we call a minimally invasive medical device company. By minimally invasive, what I mean is, if I want to get into your heart, I'm going to put a hole about the size of half a centimeter in your leg, and I'm going to push my devices up into your heart. My specific part of the business where I work endoscopy, minimally invasive means we go through an existing opening. We can figure out what the hole is. From the top or the bottom. Our company as a whole, this is a little bit out of date. You can see it says 2011. At this point, we're more than 50% outside the US. And that's getting stronger and stronger, especially with the developing countries. Okay? We have two major distribution centers in the world. One is in Quincy, Massachusetts and the others in Germany, Austria. We have a number of major manufacturing facilities. One of the biggest we have is in Norway. There are about 2,000 people in Norway. There's a few hundred working here in Cork. There's a few hundred in Clonmel. Okay. The only bigger manufacturing facility is actually in Maple Grove in Minneapolis. They're about 25. So you can see we've got a diversified set of businesses. And since most people have no idea, other than they've heard of heart stents, we're going to talk about what these other businesses are, what kind of products we have. And then at the end, I'll get into some of the statistical approaches that we take. <clears throat> so here we are. Interventional cardiology, OK? Trying to treat coronary disease. Cardiac rhythm management, so things like pacemakers, defibrillators, etc. Endoscopy, for diagnosing and treating anything in the whole digestive tract all the way from your mouth, all the way down. And for some reason, we include the lungs there now. I don't know why. And neuromodulation, which is really electronics, uh, electrophysiology. So we have devices that I can push into your heart, and I can map how the electrical impulses travel through your heart to figure out where issues are. Okay? Uh, neurology and pelvic health, so anything in the urological system or in the pelvis. Two years ago, that said urology and women's health. In the last couple of years, we've added also diagnostics and treatment for men, including in the pelvis. OK, and peripheral interventions to get into the vascular system. And I'll show you what some of the different products are in all these different areas. So let's take a look. Interventional cardiology is, in fact, our biggest business in sales. Not necessarily in profits, but in sales. So. I don't know if you've ever heard of stents. A stent is basically a tube. If I put it into your artery, it is to keep your artery open. 
right, to, to, I go in with a balloon and I clear out the plaque out of your artery where it's getting occluded, then I put in one of these stents to keep it open. Okay. Same thing for the total occlusions. The structural heart, that's what I mentioned, is the aortic valve. Think about that. We're able to replace the aortic valve through a half centimeter hole in your life. Don't have to do open heart surgery. Okay. Hypertension, it's up there. It's a serious problem. The devices to treat that are not on the market yet. Probably won't be for another five years or so. Okay. And for AFib, so atrial fibrillation, there's two types of fibrillation, right? V-fib and AFib. The V-fib, you get weak and you collapse. That's a problem. AFib, you get a stroke and you die. So that's a really big problem. So that's why we concentrate on AFib rather than V-fib. So kind of devices here. DES stands for drug eluding stents. You put a foreign body inside your body, right? It wants to grow tissue over it. It wants to reocclude where you just opened it up. So this drug elutes. Eluding means it washes out very slowly over the course of months to prevent that reocclusion. Okay, bare metal stents, various types of balloons, okay, many of which are made down the road here, a monofold road, in Bishop's house. We make a lot of balloons down in Michigan. Okay. Guide catheters, imaging systems, so I can image the inside of your heart. Okay. Cutting balloons, little balloons that got knives on the outside, so if you really got an occluded organ, I can actually rotate it and it actually basically, it's like sandpaper, but cleans out the inside of the vein. Okay. Uh, embolic protection. What that means is, if I do some of these things, I may cause blood clots. I want to put something, a filter in the way so that blood clot doesn't go to your brain. So I'll put it in here, right here in your jugular. So if anything comes up there, it gets trapped. It doesn't make it to the brain and cause a stroke. Okay? Uh, the crossing catheters to get across really tough areas where you've got basically total occlusions. Okay? Uh, the aortic valve, that's like I said, that's one of our newest products. Again, the hypertension I'll mention because we're working on it, but it's not there yet. Or I don't know if I could say it's not there yet. The device exists. Okay. I deal a lot with stat statistics, and there's a difference between statistically significant and practically significant. From a practical point of view, we can see that the treatment seems to work. But my p-value is way higher than 0 0.05. So I can't make a statistical claim okay. yet. That's where you gotta do more clinical trials to keep on going. So that's where that is at the moment, okay? And this one, the left atrial appendage, uh, that's also for dealing with strokes. Uh, I didn't even realize until three years ago when I went to one of the company meetings that this left atrial appendage existed. It's in all our hearts, right? It dates back to God knows why and what reason it was there in terms of evolution. It doesn't do anything anymore. It's just basically there but it can lead to strokes because you can get pooling of blood in there. Mm -hmm. So it's like your appendix. It serves no purpose, but it's there. So cardiac rhythm management. So brachycardia, cardiac arrest or heart failure. Pacemakers. Right? Take the pacemaker and plant the, plant the electrodes in your heart. So that's been around forever, pacemakers. Okay? this implantable defibrillator, which has been around for maybe five to 10 years plus. This is the newest one, this SICD, subcutaneous implantable defibrillator. So the electrodes go to your heart. This thing senses the current flowing through your heart. If your heart starts to go flaky, beats too fast or too slow, the stimulation will come on. Not only that, it has Bluetooth, and it sends a message to your doctor that this person's heart is malfunctioning. So you'll get a call from your doctor and say, hey, your rhythm is up hot, what is it? So I've got people, well, you know, I felt so good, I decided to take a run and I hadn't done that in years. So yes, it was up, that's fine. So on the other hand, we've had some where somebody collapsed and we can call the emergency and, and, and the code pick them up. Okay, uh, the resignalization pacemakers, okay, and the, again, the defibrillators. That's this stuff, that's what we make in Kalan now. 
It's all this. Defibrillators, pacemakers. Okay, so our two major manufacturing sites for those are Clonmel, okay, and St. Paul, Minnesota. So electrophysiology. Okay, diagnosing arrhythmias, visualizing the inside of your heart, both visualizing the structure and visualizing, as I said, how the carts flow through, where you get a trigger up here and your valves are not working, you know, they're, they're not working in concert the way they should. So you can image that and find out where the issues are. Okay, so that allows you then to treat it. So you can treat AFib, again, because you can die from AFib. VFib, you get weak, okay. okay. And the tachycardias. So, steerable catheters, which by the way was the very first product Boston Scientific ever made. Soft steerable catheters. That was back in 1979 when the company was started. Okay. This blazer, it's got electrodes on it, so if I need to ablate or remove tissue, I can do that. Okay. This is the mapping catheter. That when it says mapping, what it's mapping is how the electrical impulse, impulses flow through your heart. Okay. This is the more advanced mapping catheter, which now has one of the big advances in electronics, higher resolution, more memory. Now I can get a gigabyte of memory in here where you only have a megabyte over here, and you have very rough maps. Okay. Ultrasound imaging as well if you've got somebody who really can't go under fluid or can't go under x-rays. So ultrasound imaging catheters. Okay. This is a Temperature ablation catheter, I can heat it up to ablate tissue. If there's something blocking the way, you can basically burn the tissue. Okay. That's the next generation here with the laser 2, complete with the, the control systems, of course. And other than heat, you could also chill. You basically get frostbite, which kills off the tissue. So there are cases where you want to kill off tissues or certain nerves. Okay, neuromodulation. Huge business in chronic pain. By chronic pain, I mean people who are so taken down by pain that four to five times a month they cannot get out of bed. They can't work. They can't get out of bed. Okay, and Parkinson's disease. So, for the chronic pain, you see this? See those little white spots? Those are each electrodes. You take those, that strip of electrodes, and they implant it on your spine. And then they take the wire, they dig a little pocket over here, and they put a remote control in. And then they give you a little hand remote control. So you can push the button, fires the electrodes, stimulates the spine, overstimulates the spine so it can't sense pain coming from your legs. So it shuts down the pain. Okay, so they're a great device. Again, for people who are chronically so ill with pain that they just can't get out of bed. And then this was actually based on the same kind of a system. They'll take electrodes, they got DBS, deep brain stimulation. They will implant them behind your animals. Again, remote controlled, uh, with a recharger that's inside your neck. And when you lie down on your pillow at night, inductively coupled, it recharges. Okay. And so what you find is for Parkinson's, you do not eliminate the need for L-DOPA. You still need the L-DOPA with Parkinson's. However, I'm familiar with Parkinson's. My, my advisor in graduate school had Parkinson's. And the poor guy, you could see when he needed to get his L-DOPA treatment because he was shaking like crazy. And then he'd go off and he'd get the L-DOPA <laughs> And he said, you know, they gave me these treatments and before I was doing this. And now I'm doing this. I'm shaking the other way because they overdosed on the treatment. They didn't know how to control it. So now you can cut down on that L-DOPA and not get the overdose. You still have to use it on a monthly basis, but with the implantable electrodes, you get better control. So, endoscopy, uh, again, that's the business that I'm in, at least nominally. I work with all of our businesses, okay, but uh, GI, the GI tract, cancers, okay, pancreatic and the biliary ducts. Okay. Pancreas is one of our biggest issues, right, because you can live without your kidneys. You can live with half a liver, 
but you can't live without your pancreas. And the fact is, 95% of all diagnosed pancreatic cancers are fatal within six months. So being able to diagnose those early and see how to treat them early is important. That's what we want. Uh, bleeding, obviously bleeding is a bad thing. We'll talk about some ways that we deal with bleeding. Okay, feeding tubes, nutritional support. Okay, and this is one of the newest businesses, asthma, pulmonary disease. How does that fit with your digestive tract? I have no idea. But the cancers, uh, we make what are called forceps, biopsy forceps. I'll show you an example of some of those for taking samples. Okay, stents, again those tubes, except these ones are plastic. Okay, it's woven plastic made out of polyester, usually coated in silicone so you don't get tissue in growth. Metal stents, by the way, if you see these woven stents, gallbladder, that's where we make all our woven stents. They weave these, they weave them out of what's called nitinol. It's a shape memory alloy. You heat it up to body temperature, it goes back to whatever its original shape was no longer how long it was in the delivery system. Okay, and the biopsy forceps, we'll take a little closer look at that. So the pancreatic biliary disease, so pancreatic stents, which I'll mention those later, but those are currently in clinical trial. Access, you gotta be able to get there to implant the stent, okay? Endoscopic ultrasound, so there are devices that you use endoscopic rather than Fluoro or x-ray imaging. Okay. You can do some digital imaging. Hemostasis. Stasis means stopped. Hemo means blood. Is to stop bleeding. Okay. Access is important. Enteral. So if I'm going to put a feeding tube in, see a little tube with a little bulb here. So make a hole. Again, as small as I can get away with because it's minimally invasive. I push this inside and then I inflate the balloon so that it doesn't pull back out. And you've got one on both sides. And then you run a tube from that down to your jejunum, and I can give you feeding. You know, anything from pediatrics all the way up to full room dose. Um, for the pulmonary disease, bronchial thermoplasty, okay, airway stents, again, when my brother-in-law says, you guys make stents for everything. Yeah, we do. <laughs> for the colon, for the esophagus, for the airway, for your your, your pulmonary systems, okay, and the endoscopic bronchial ultrasound, again, for imaging inside the lungs. One of the things that's worse, or at least as bad, as pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, because it almost never gets diagnosed before it's stage three or four, at which point it's just too late, it's palliative. If you can catch it on one or two, now you've got treatments that you could use that people will live. So we are working on imaging therapies for that, or imaging techniques to actually get down into the lung as deeply as you can go to, to find out whether indeed there's a problem or not. So let me mention biopsy forceps. <coughs> one, of us, one of our biggest volume products. As I said, this was 2011. It's actually 14, we make 14 million of these a year. Okay, now that's a nice big picture and it looks great. We built the prototypes in our prototype lab in Marlboro, Massachusetts, and then we'll put them in the hands of doctors and say, how does that work? Okay, so here's RJ, radial jaw biopsy forceps. Incredibly sharp. Doesn't that look like a nice big picture? You know how big those jaws are? Not that big. Because you've got to push them down the catheter or an endoscope, which has a four millimeter working channel. So they've got to be less than four millimeters across. And they've got to be able to go 255 centimeters through a tortuous anatomy. And then when I activate the handle back here, they have to work based on the wire. And it's all mechanical. So it looks simple, but it's a fairly, com fairly complex piece of engineering to build one of those. But we've got these nice sharp jaws, and they basically clamp down. Now I don't have to cut you open to take a biopsy. If I did x ray or a CAT scan, Right, or I did MRI, some magnetic resonance imaging, or there's something that doesn't look right, I can push one of these in there and I can take a sample and I can take it out and I can do diagnosis on it. Okay, so typically used in the GI lab. Okay. 
taking out living tissue for inspection to diagnose or exclude. It's not really for treatment, it's for diagnosis to tell you whether you need to do something else. Okay, upper or lower gastrointestinal. So you push it through the scope. Again, 255 centimeters away through a tortuous anatomy at what we would call, when they talk about uh, endoscopes, they talk about full retroflex. You know what that means? The end is at a 270 degree angle. So I've taken this device, right, that's only four millimeters wide with a control wire that's narrower than that, pushing it down through the 270, 270 degrees, and when I pull on the handle, it better open and it better close. Okay, so that's why it gets used. It works really well. Okay, close in the right place, pull out the tissue sample. You get large enough samples. You can see some of them come with these spikes on them because some doctors like to take five samples at the same time and they put them on the spikes and they take all five out. Others don't like them, so they leave the spike out and they just go without them. We supply them both and they just look at a box and choose which ones they want. Okay. The resolution clip, I mentioned hemostasis. That's what this is. You see, again, it looks like a clip, which it is. And this is if you have a place that's bleeding, somewhere in the digest digestive tract, for whatever reason. Sometimes it's bleeding because we just took a because we just took a biopsy sample and we ripped out tissue, so now it's bleeding. Okay, sometimes it's bleeding because we took off a pollen. Sometimes it's bleeding because it was just a cut there. Like this thing, take the jaws, clamp them down on the bleeder, right? Push the handle one step further and you hear this click, and the jaws snap off and stay inside the body. And then you take away the delivery system. Okay. So that's what they're meant for. See this right here? That's where it snaps off. They do not typically stay in the body. Because what happens? Think about when you get a cut, what happens? When you get a scab, right? And it heals over. When you get the scab and it heals over, the scab falls off. Well, the jaw is attached to the scab where it was bleeding before, so that comes off and passes naturally from the body over the course of time. So typically within five days to three weeks at the most. Not that we examined in humans, but we did some dog trials. So three weeks is the most of ever took. Okay, so there's actually a new generation of this on the market now. The biggest complaint was I would go to clamp here and decide, Doc, I really would like it to be at that angle because the cut is this way, not that way. So I want to close the cut. And they would try to turn it and we'd get what we call a whip. So it would turn the handle three times, and then the jaws would do this. Go right past where you want it. The new generation, we call it Resolution 360. If I turn 15 degrees here, the jaws turn 15 degrees. So it's a one-to-one -one rotation. <coughs> okay, spy scope. Uh, this was introduced last year. New, new product, spy scope DS, the digital system. I mentioned the pancreas. The spy scope was the first device that could give you a three-dimensional picture of the pancreas. You literally would push this imaging device inside the pancreas and you could see everything there was to see. So, if you're not sure, you have determined strictures or you've got ducts, you've got stones in the duct, you can see what they are, you've got pseudocysts that you want to therapeutically puncture and drain. So you can see here, this is the, the end of the scope, okay? You can see these four holes are what we would call lumens. Those are tubes that go all the way through. So you're going to push this in your mouth, down through your stomach, up through your bile duct, and into your pancreas. So again, through the tortuous anatomy, 270 degrees, okay? So one of these is for flushing. I can take saline and wash stuff out of the way. One of these is a working channel. I can put devices down there. And one of these is for a fiber optic, so I can put a light, so I can see what I'm doing. And down at the end here is actually, it used to be we had a fiber optic for the first generation. Guess what? Technology has changed. Anybody got a camera on one of those? That's what it is. So we need a high resolution. We've got custom built cameras about the same size as what goes into that phone. So it's, you know, it's, it's only about yay big but it images perfectly the inside of the pancreas. And what comes with it, this one that looks a lot like those radio jaw forceps, except we call them spy bite. 
because now we don't have four millimeters real estate, we got two. So you got, this looks nice and big, but that's a two millimeter diameter. So you gotta be able to push a working device through that. So that would be things like this, which is the bite. With this, if you can see it, it's what we call a, a snare. Right? If you, ever, if you ever watch a western, right, and you see the cowboy rope the, the horse or, or the cow, that's a snare. It's basically a loop that you can put around something and you can tighten it up. So if there's a polyp or something there you're not sure of, you can squeeze it so that now I can section it and cut it off. So various other types of things. This is actually an eight lumen device. You only see four. The four you can't see are for steering wires. So you can steer up, down, and right left. So you can put it exactly where you want to put it. Okay. So this. I won't try to fail. I, I can. No. ERCP is a very common procedure in the digestive tract. So endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatical pump graft. <laughs> okay, very common by the way. ERCP is very common in Europe, very common in the United States, very common in Japan. Virtually unheard of in the developing world. So we've actually set up an institute to train Chinese physicians in ERCP because they have a tremendous need for it to just know how to do it. Okay, this is another new device. This was introduced last year, EMR, endoscopic mucosal resection. Resection sounds nice, doesn't it? You know what resection means? It means I cut off your tissue. That's what it means, resection. <laughs> the next generation of that is EMD, endoscopic mucosal dissection, which sounds more like what they're doing. But the resection, what it is primarily is aimed at is, is Barrett's esophagus, which is at the top of your stomach. There is a sphincter there, and sometimes you get irritation around the top of the sphincter, and it'll eventually lead to this, this kind of irritation, Barrett's esophagus, a very important thing because it's a typical precursor to esophageal cancer. So it's critical to know whether that's gone as far as esophageal cancer, or if I want to do resection or dissection, how much do I have to cut out till it's all gone but not take so much that I'm weakening the opening into the stomach. So this one has a vacuum tube, and typically on the end is one of these. It's high tech, right? Rubber bands. That's what those are. They're isoprene rubber bands. Isoprene <coughs> rubber, right? Been around since the 1930s. Natural rubber. So these isoprene bands, what happens is you take this, it's got a vacuum, and it's also got saline flush. So you take saline flush, then you suck up the tissue from here. These caps are typically on the end here. You can see the little blue band. You roll off the rubber band. Now, if the natural opening for a rubber band is this big, and you've got it stretched on a device that big, what happens when you roll it off? Of course, it shrinks back. So now what it does is it forms essentially a pseudocyst. This thing is now sticking up. And then I can come along with one of those snares, and I can cut it off. And then I can use the vacuum to pull it back up. And now I can give it to somebody to do the cytology and histology to say, all right, it's Barrett's. Is it precancerous or not? Do we need to do a more treatment? OK. So bronchial thermoplastic, the other system, one of my favorites. It's one of the reasons I got to come to court multiple times. We built this one in only one place, and that's over on Long Farm Road in Bishopstown. It's for treatment of asthma. OK. So it's for severe asthma. People who typically are losing a lot of time at work, multiple visits to the emergency room four, five, six times a year. I don't know about emergency rooms here, but if you go to an emergency room in the States and it's a Friday night, you could be there for 14 hours before anybody sees you. So it's not a pleasant experience. So less of that is a good thing. So what this is, is you insert it into the airway. It looks like this. Sort of like an umbrella without the covering. So it comes in flat, gets pushed out here. Then you push the handle and then it pushes out these little tines, just like with an umbrella. They come into contact with the smooth muscle in the airway. Asthma is caused by a number of things that trigger it. 
But what it really is caused by is too much smooth muscle. It clamps down your airway. So this comes into contact with the smooth muscle, heats up to 55 Celsius for about three seconds, which is enough to kill the top layer of skin. So the top layer of smooth muscle. The clinical trials say this works. For people who had severe asthma and the drugs didn't work, this does work. Okay. So that's what they mean by energy <coughs> to heat the tissue. It's not charring to the point where it's burned, but it's heated up to the point that it's basically denatured, dead. Okay? We'll come back to that one a little bit. Some of the GI stents, as I mentioned, my brother says, Jesus, you guys got stents for everything. Yeah, we do. For the duodenum, the biliary stents, pancreatic stents, colonic stents, the esophageal stents. Okay, I don't know, you may not, I didn't know until I got into the business how they used to treat obstructions of the esophagus. And many parts of the world still do treat obstructions of the esophagus. The current standard of treatment would be to take one of our balloons from Bishopstown and inflate this thing until the esophagus is open and then put in a stent, right? In many parts of the world, the standard of care is I take a wooden dowel with increasing diameter and I take a mallet and I pound it down your esophagus till it's open. Literally, that's what they do. And then you take it out. And then six months later, it's closed up, so now I gotta do it again. Okay, so but the point of the stents is to keep it open so I don't have to do it again. And the point of the balloons is, can you imagine? You're not even under anesthesia. And they're pounding this stick down your throat. Ugh. In any case, here's some of the stents, as I said, woven. As soon as you see those, you can think, oh, that's what we make them. We make them bare metal and we make them silicone coating. Depends on the reason. Okay. So the other stents, this one is implanted. That one's actually implanted in the, uh, that one's actually in, in the pancreas with the end hanging out, deliberately with the end hanging out, by the way, so that we can come along and retrieve it. So if I take, think about this, this is like a wire mesh. If I take and I pull here, you know what happens? It shrinks. So now it comes out easily. So that's why we leave the end sticking out. You can grab the end. As soon as you start to pull on it, the whole thing goes from being 25 centimeters to less than four. Okay. And then in use, you can see where it's implanted. Okay, the pancreatic stents, I mentioned that. That looks a little different. That's not a braided stent. These are not made in Galway, by the way. They're made in Spencer, Indiana. This is basically a plastic extrusion, a plastic tube, which the guys from Galway make fun of. They say, oh, you're, you're, that's just a straw. Anybody can do that. Well, it's not just a straw, and not anybody can do that. You can see a couple of features. There's barbs on either end to keep it from slipping out of where it was placed. The biggest issue with you putting something to keep the area open is if it moves. So that's to keep it from moving. And it's got these little holes so that the pancreatic Juice and our bile, duct, our bile juice can get in there, flow into the common bile duct and get excreted from the bile. These are currently in clinical trial. The reason they're a clinical trial is we've sold biliary for the bile duct for at least four or five years. And we know physicians are using those off label. The label makes no claim about using it, but they're using them in the pancreas they don't have anything else. They're the right size. The issue being, the bile duct is a lot more resilient than the pancreas. It doesn't take much to insult the pancreas and then you got the pancreatitis. So that's the problem with these stiffer stents that we would make for the bile duct. So as I said, this is on the second year of clinical trials now. So hopefully within another two to three years, these will be on the market for that. Specifically for the pancreas. Okay, airway stents. This is one of the biggest ones we're working on at the moment. Okay, so optimized geometry, when they say flares, what they mean is it's a little wider at the end. Okay, of course you gotta have fatigue properties. Doesn't sound like much, but if I take one of these metal things and I put it into your lungs, 
every time you take a breath, you're stressing. Then when you cough, you're really stressing. Coughs are one of the biggest things that, one of the biggest issues with airway stents. Not just us, not just Boston Scientific, everybody who makes them, okay? Migration. Put it in, you come back three days later, it's not in the same place. Sometimes it falls down into the lungs. It's gone, they can't, they can't even find it. So in one case, I'm, one case I'm aware of where the complaint came in that the, the patient started coughing and there was a stent. So it displaced in the wrong direction, you know. But it happens. So we are working on those. There, there's active, active research for technology <coughs> development, not product development. For us, those are two different things. Technology development is a blue sky. How do I actually get technologies I can do stuff with? Product development is how do I build something? So the technology development is a way for this because nobody's had great success with avoiding displacement of your waste. Okay? The urology pelvic health business. Kidney stones. Gallstones. Okay, I've never had one, but I hear they're extremely painful. Okay. Prostate. Okay. But they say 50% of men over the age of 50 are affected by benign prostate disease. And 70% of the men over 70. Stress incontinence, prolapse, particularly pronounced for women who have had children. There's an awful lot of stress placed on the body and the muscles get stretched. Okay? Or abnormal uterine bleeding. So for stones, I don't know if you can see, that's a basket. You can see there's four wires here. So this comes out laying flat. And then I push the handle and it opens up and I put it over the stone and I clamp on the stone and I pull it back up through the cap. The stents. After I push this catheter down through your body, that's an insult to the body. You now it wants to swell shut. We, you take out the stone, that's a good thing. Now you can leave the stent in for a few days until everything calms down. Guide wires, so I can get to some of these more difficult places. Okay, dilatation. Sounds like dilation, which is what it is, to make the opening larger. So we made what we call tones, things to cut. So you can cut a sphincter so you can get in a larger device. Okay, resection. Again, what's resection? It's a nice name for I'm going to cut your tissue out of the way. And laser fibers. So those get used for a couple of reasons. One is sometimes those stones are too big to take out. I just cannot even get them back into the catheter. So now I push a fiber optic laser down there and I blow it to pieces. And then I can gather up all the little pieces in the basket and take them out. Okay, urethral slings or implants, again, to reinforce those muscles that weaken during childbirth. Okay, the same thing with this, with those slings, okay, or that. And the remote suturing devices, if you want to sew something in place, you don't necessarily have to get your fingers in there. You can do it from three feet away. Okay, so here's an example of one of the urethral stents. Okay, you got a blockage, you got a stone. <clears throat> so now the urine is backing up and it's very painful. Until such time as I can get the stone out of there, I can put one of these in and I put the end of the stent up past the stone so now the urine will flow through the stent and back out through the bladder. <coughs> okay, so kidney stones, like I said, not that I want them. I've never had one, but I hear they're incredibly painful. Sometimes people will wait just till they pass. Other times they're just too large, they won't pass, then we go with them. With baskets. Okay. This one I don't have a picture, but I put it up there because I thought it was a really cool idea. It's, it's a reverse phase transition material at room temperature. Right? What happens when you take water? Room temperature is water. You cool it down, it's ice. This, at room temperature, you cooled it down, it's liquid. You warm it up, it's a gel. You cool it back down, it goes back to liquid. So, it's a fluid at room temperature. You put it in a syringe, drop through one of these catheters, 
you put it beyond one of these stones that you want to retrieve because when you go to grab it with a basket, you don't want the stone to migrate. So you put a wall behind the stone. Now it's body temperature. So now it becomes solid. So you put it in as liquid. It became a solid. Keeps the stone from migrating. You take away the stone. Now you wash it with cold, normal saline. Becomes liquid again. Flushes away out of the body. So it's strictly a temporary block that you can get rid of by just cooling it down. So peripheral intervention. Um, sorry, Sean, Take just to say it's two o'clock there. Okay. Yeah. Shall I pick it up? Yeah, yeah. maybe five okay. or ten more minutes. Okay. So peripheral intervention. Uh, again, this is minimally invasive. Do things like stents, because we've got stents for everything, or balloons. Okay, or some of these cutting balloons that I mentioned before. Okay. Uh, these embolization coils so that I can actually take and, and basically microwave tissue in place. Right? Embolic particles, which are in development, which would be things like if you need chemotherapy, who wants chemotherapy where you've got a massive dose and your hair falls out and you're sick as a dog for the next six months? How about if you could put it inside these little particles? and take and inject them and put them around the tumor so you get a massive dose when you need it and not in the rest of the body. That's really what that's about. So that's in development. The renal, renal denervation for hypertension is also in development. No statistically significant effects yet. An observational effect, but no statistically significant effects. And then finally, this one is the, uh, this is for dealing with aneurysms. And aneurysm is a bubble on the side of your blood vessel where it's weak and the wall is thin. So it's subject to rupture and then you can die of a blood loss. Well, in this case, you take this little fiber, these fibers, this coil, and you put it into the aneurysm. The fibers will collect blood cells. So now you get a clot. And you get a clot across the whole aneurysm, so now it doesn't leak. That's really what that's for. Okay, uh, we'll stick the pick. Get going here. So this Watchman was released earlier this year. That is to deal with that extra appendage in your heart that can lead to strokes. Because nobody knows why it's there in the first place. Uh, Lotus, we're making those in Galway to replace your aortic valve. Okay. The deep brain simulators, those are being made in California. These, the subcutaneous, the ICDs, those are all made in, either in Minnesota or in Clonmel. Okay. The bioabsorbable polymers, we're working on that one. The cardiac mapping and navigation, like it says here, it's investigational. Some of it is. The first products are just ready for market now. So quick stats. Probably way our can today. Okay, we are a highly regulated industry. Okay, so we have to deal with FDA. We have to deal with the European regulatory agencies. Two weeks ago, we had a visit from the Irish regulatory agencies into Galway. Okay. So we do what we call design verification. R&D folks do design verification. Does the device do what you said it would do? We do design validation. Does it do what the doctor and the patient want it to do? Okay. We do process validation. Once I've covered those, can I actually build it? Reliable. And then we do complaint training. <coughs> Corrective action, protective action, or preventive action. If we get a spike in complaints, and it happens, why, what's the root cause, how do we fix it? So, we're gonna talk about a little bit. <coughs> like I said, we make, the only place we make those now is over here at Lotto Farm Road. The original first generation was from California. So we had uh, clinical trials, several hundred patients, had preliminary endpoints, you can see the decrease, I mean, Increase in the health of the patient, no question about that. Five-year target, those should be coming in soon. The three-year results just came in, and they're very similar to the one-year results. Okay. When I say Rev2 here, what I'm talking is about the one that's made over here in Mount Farm Road. Rev1 was from California. So, design engineers said, look, they're going to take this thing. It looks like an umbrella. We're going to open it up inside your lungs, and we're going to activate it. How many times will we do that for a single procedure with a single device? And they went and watched what physicians did, and they talked to them, and came to the conclusion, 
you know, probably at most 150 times. Because you're only covering eight millimeters at a time. So they're like they're here, 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 and they do the different loads of the load. Okay, so here was the results. It's a skewed distribution, which you might expect. There's no way, I know statisticians love normal data. There's no way data like this can be normal. Right? Normal extends infinitely in both directions. The only way this data can be normal is if you activate it before you do the treatment. It's an impossibility. So there's a wall over here. It's got to be at least one treatment. And that's what it was. It was skewed to the high side. So in terms of design verification, do we want to go off and test this in 10,000 patients? No, we want to come up with a bench test that we can execute to show the device tells what we thought it should do. So it's a finite data set, we got a couple hundred people. What we did was you say, all right, typical little estimate for the population, plus or minus three standard deviations. Okay, why is it plus or minus three standard deviations? Anybody know? Because Walter Schuhart said so in 1939. When he published his book on control chart theory, he said three standard deviations is your population. That's the only reason why. Okay. But we use that anyway. So we said, all right, we're going to take this data, make it normal, put this normal tolerance interval, not calculate three standard deviations, because that's a point estimate. There's a confidence interval around that, and you've got to take that into account, and that's bounded by however many parts of the or, or devices you measure. So we go ahead, we did that, we converted it into normal data, calculated based on a logarithmic scale what the value was, and then said, all right, you exponentiate that. Turns out these guys who said 150, they were pretty good. I mean, this was a back of the envelope or, you know, I'm going to test the wind. Yeah, I'd say about 150. That would be well, it turns out they were right. So that's what we then would test. So that's how we would use ex existing clinical data to set a specification so we don't have to test on people. OK? So then, that was based on version one. Version two. We built it here. OK, so there's some slight changes. Can we show? that it's equally as reliable as what they were building in California. The question being, in California, you had the world's best engineers who knew this system inside and out, building it by hand and building one a day. Meanwhile, we want to build 700 every week. Okay? So we did a reliability approach, classic reliability statistics. Cycle salt of failure, find out what is their characteristic lifetime. MTTF means mean time to failure. That's a typical thing people will quote in terms of reliability, MTTF. So we're shooting for 150 cycles. 1,134 is the typical lifetime, way past what we need. However, it's not just mean, it means average, right? The average time to failure is up there over 1,000. But you know what? If you're going to put your device inside of me, I don't care what your average is. I want to know what your individuals are. What's the chance it's going to fail when you put it in me? Okay, not the average. So you could actually calculate that. For 150 cycles, the point estimate for failure rate, based on the data we had, was around 0.5%. And the 95% confidence limit on that is around 0.7%. So, if every single one of these devices got cycled to 150 cycles, there's about a 0.7% chance of seeing one fail. Now, is that acceptable? And that is not a statistical question. That's a medical question, and that's a business question. Are you willing to take the risk? Okay? It's a risk-benefit analysis. Because what happens if one of these things fails? It looks like an umbrella. What happens if this leg pops off and I try to pull that out through a lung? I just punctured the lung. So it's a, it's a critical question. So is 0.7% failure acceptable? Well, when you go back and look at how many people go to 150, we only had one. So combining less than a half percent of the population is going to use 150 with the 0.7%. 
then, then the business and medical decision was yes, that's an acceptable risk. Much as I would like to say there's such a thing as zero risk, there is no such thing, there never is. Okay, and then finally I'm going to talk here about my favorite statistical tool of all time. Statistically designed experiments. So why is it my favorite statistical tool of all time? I'm basically a lazy person. And anything that lets me do half the work and answer the questions is a good thing in my book. Absolutely a good thing. So, we do a lot of these two-level factorials, as they're called. These are not new tools. Two-level factorials go back to Sir Ronald Fisher, 1925. Here I'm going to show you an example of a response surface. So this is a family business, by the way, because response surfaces, George Box, Ronald Fisher's son-in-law. As you can imagine, you know, Christmas dinner, they can talk over the DOEs. <laughs> so this is a response surface where we, you know, we got these little tines that have to be welded, stainless steel. And so they were laser welding. So you could control the, how long, how much power, and how fast it scanned. We couldn't use, because we tried, 0.6 milliseconds at 50% of maximum power. Stainless steel is great stuff, but not when it melts. And it melted away. There was nothing but a hole. So there was points where we couldn't work. So we set up what we call the constraint design. It looks something like this. At the highest power and the highest time, exclude that. Just collect data in here. This is the whole region where we could work and get something. And now optimize that. So it came back, like I said, it was 20 different experiments, but it answered all of our questions about a whole series of different that's a typical response, where red is high, blue is low, and we excluded the area we weren't interested in. So then we did an optimization for seven different things at the same time. This is where I really like the oil. Because if I can optimize seven things at the same time, I was always taught to keep everything constant, manipulate one so you can see what's going on. That's absolutely the wrong thing to do. Manipulate them all in a controlled fashion. So we got the three things we're controlling, and then we had a visual inspection for was it a shallow well, so the line to, to not, not hold very well, okay? A visual on the well itself, did it look right? Okay. Was it discolored? Did I cook it? People don't want to be putting electrodes into people's bodies if they look and it looks kind of black or brown. They're just Even if it's not toxic, they don't, don't see it as a good thing. Then we have tensile strengths. How, how much power does it take to actually rip these things off? Okay, and then the weld length and the width. We did an optimization, it's called a simplex optimization. Based on desirability on a scale of zero to one for each of these. So zero, I did not meet the constraints where I said this is at least a minimum performance you have to deliver. One, I nailed it all exactly. And anywhere in between is on a scale of zero to one. So, we're doing seven of these things at the same time, calculating individual desirability and calculating what's called a geometric mean. An arithmetic mean is you have them all up and divide by n, right? A geometric mean is you multiply them all and take the nth root. So, since we're doing seven optimizations, we did multiply all those desirabilities and take the seventh root. That's really all the, the notation up there is saying. So we could see on some of them, we got a desirability of one. We exactly met what we needed to meet. On some of them, we got about halfway up. Is that okay? Well, if I put in my constraints such that this is what I need, it's still met my constraints. So this was the balance that gave me the best optimization between all seven of those at the same time. And so this plot here is my optimization. So what I'm saying from a manufacturing point of view, right? if I'm going to do process validation now coming down the road, where is it I'm going to validate? Well, anywhere up here. I meet all my constraints. As I start to move longer in power, higher in power, okay, I'm less and less and less desired. So then we did what's called a process capability analysis. Okay. 
I don't know if you're familiar with the Process Capability Index, PPK as it's called, commonly used. Uh, it's basically a measure of a z-score, number of standard deviations from your average to your specification. So larger is better here, and one and a half here is considered outstanding. One and a half or better for this index. It says 3.4 DPMO, that stands for defects per million opportunities. Build a million devices, you might have three that are defective. So that's why 1.5, I mean, three out of a million is a pretty good number. So here are the index. Um, it's quarter past two. I'm just sorry. conscious that people might have meetings with them in uh, If you're happy to continue, if people need to leave now, um, we can let you go on then afterwards. Yes. One more slide, so okay. we'll go. This one, the index is about 1.1. So that's not <coughs> 3.4 defects per million opportunities. That's more like 500 per million. Now, it's a business decision. It's not a risk that's acceptable. So basically, we are minimally invasive. Wide range of products, over 3,000 different products. Okay. But the statistics are fundamental to the patients and to our development efforts. So, sorry, I took some <laughs>